acoustic energy is back. I am so excited. Finally. That we are back. Seems like it's been forever, my Man, dude. Man, it's been forever. Like, it really has been forever. I, f I literally feel like we haven't recorded since 2018. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, uh, my name is Joel. And my name is Dale. We currently live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And due to COVID, we have been in a lockdown. Yes. Our lockdown basically was for everyone to stay home unless you stay needed home. to go to yes. a grocery store. Essentials. Or essentials, yes. exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, so unfortunately, we weren't able to shoot yes. acoustic energy. But we do have a ton of things prepared. Yes. And I was all. trying to get a show in, um, which yeah. is why I went by Joel's that, house. That is... Something that we do need to talk about. Um, yes. Um, so, he was not very understanding of my passion or my need to kind of, you know, connect. But we just can't record due to the fact that we're in a lockdown. Coming for a boy, you just can't record now. Exactly. So I'm just curious to why you're at my house. All right. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Kind of it, weird. Was, it was the date that we had on the schedule to record. Yeah. I was following what the the team said. Like I was following the orders. You that weren't did. following the orders. That's why you were doing a snippet. <laughs> why we should have been you should have been ready to record. That's what I'm saying. Okay, let you know what? I'm not gonna argue with you. <laughs> you're you're right. <laughs> but no, we're just happy to be here, man. Brother, I haven't seen you in so long other than I you know. showing up to my house unexpectedly. Yeah. How um, have you been? I've been good. I've been trying to make it. As you know, I'm a teacher. And so you've been, you've been working from home? Working from home. And How is that? Whew. You know what? At first, I thought it would have been a little difficult because okay. I'm more in the arts. So, okay. Um, it, music and, and some of the subjects that require, it works so much better when we are in person. Absolutely. But it, it was actually pretty okay. I found a nice background so I could do anything. Is that the same background you were using in our Zoom meeting? Probably. Okay, cool. Probably, 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 probably the same. But it's been good. We're, we're, you know, we're glad that we're in the space where we know. But Absolutely. it has been good. It has been good. Well, I'm, I'm very happy that you have stayed safe. I'm happy that your family has yes. stayed safe. I yes. hope that you guys continue to stay safe. And safe. Same Thank you. I appreciate right. that. There's something that you're wearing. Uh, <laughs> that I think that we should discuss. <laughs> Why don't you tell the people? Well, what you're first wearing? of all, I'm wearing the top tier premium. <laughs> Top quality acoustic energy white, or you may call it ivory sweater. <laughs> Not a zip up. This is just a straight hoodie. Get yourselves one. I'm and I noticed, yes, yes, just the black t-shirt. Quality is very um, mm, smooth, very pristine. Yeah, you can't touch it and not go. Oh. <laughs> poof, poof. I'm so happy to be back, yeah. brother. I'm happy to be here with you guys. Yes, I'm happy to yes. be here with our team. Yes. Um, and this month is very special to us. Yes. That is, as it is, Black History yes. Month. We celebrate our culture. We celebrate our community. We acknowledge and we pay homage and we just support, a, you know, just our culture a little bit more. Granted, I do think that we should be celebrated all year round. Absolutely. But totally I'm agree. grateful that we celebrate holistically what we are about in the month of February. I'm thinking that's enough small talk. I am so eager to get into this show. As am I, sir. So I to start us off, we are going to have our Black National Anthem by one of our team members, Michael Walton. Thank you. 
to our own Michael Walton. Yo, he can that. play, man. <laughs> that boy is something serious. And I keep telling people that I am just as good on guitar, but nobody wants to book me for any of these guitar. But this is a new year. This is a new year. So when I show up. Yeah, I would have booked you, but I, I'm fully booked. All my guitars. <laughs> you know what? I'm I got. I, I, That's just no hate. Room. That's just there's hate. No room. Nonetheless, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited about where we're going to start right here with our first act. Our first act for today comes to us from Africa. What did I say, my brother? Africa. Africa. We're going back to the motherland. There you go. They're called Shower Power. Yes. Now, yes. Shower Power, they are one of the most prolific Christian a cappella groups in Africa. Stemming from their name, meaning Shower the Holy Ghost Power. The group believes not only in the transforming power of God's Holy Spirit, but also in the need to spread the power to others through song. Shower Power has performed in various countries, including the Republic of South Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and the United States of America. That's a lot of places, my Bro, brother. Bro, they're getting around for sure. Yes. The group's latest album, The Journey, received the 2012 United States Contemporary Acapella Society Accolade for the Best African Acapella Group. The aim of the group is to spread the gospel and prepare the hearts of men and women to accept Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, shower power.
and up the end. Yeah. I said, hey, oh, I said, hey, oh, I said, hey, oh, love one another, yeah, love is kind, love is kind. Come on, suffers now, never fails, believes on things. Come on, everybody, love one another, don't fight each other. Sing again and say, Come on, and this night Come on, everybody, love one another Don't fight each other Sing again and say, hey, oh I said, hey, oh I said, hey, oh Love one another, yeah Did you hear the harmony? Beautiful. Loved it. Loved it. Without love. Without Beautiful love. song. I know that uh, they are watching right now. So thank you so very much for being a part of thank our show. Thank you to Shower uh, Continue to pray for our family yes. as we continue to pray for you all. Yes. Next up, we have this young lady from Montreal. Her yes. name is Rowan Higgins. Okay. Now, a little bit about Rowan. She started out as a hyper-at-risk youth entangled in the system. Now she is an active community change agent. She's a committed educator, she's a coach, she's a speaker, she's an event producer. Now, her community service and creative accomplishments have been recognized by the Montreal Community Care Awards. Dubbed as Blue River, her unique style, flow, and delivery has gained her opportunities to perform before different audiences all over the world nice. in many different time zones. Amazing. Now, I've heard her before, and she was amazing. I am excited, I am pleased to welcome Miss Rowan Higgins. Hey everyone, what's up? My name is Rowan Higgins and I am a spoken word artist. So excited to be here on the Acoustic Energy TV. Gotta give a shout out to Dale and Joel and the whole team because for anybody who's going to create a safe space, a safe community space for faith-based individuals, yo, that's dope. So yo, as a coach that works with creatives, I think it's really amazing and important that we remind creators to create. And not only that, for those of you guys who are out there I don't think you're creative. Remember, you're made in the image of the creator. So let's go. See you soon. Peace. I am a witness. I am a witness to another black man saying, I can't breathe. His last breath stolen by the person who's supposed to serve and protect, shouting for his mama while an officer forcibly kneels in his neck, his hands shackled in chrome steel bracelets while a passerby shouts out that he is in medical distress. Instead of an arrest, they laid this man to rest, forging another story that he was resisting arrest. I'm a witness of strange fruit being crushed against concrete, freshly pressed by the knees of an officer of peace, the juice of a human life pouring out of its vessel, trying to find its soul lost in the streets. Sweet to the one who just picked another nigger from the tree of life, bitter to us who still has to fight this fight. The undertaker in uniform wiped his hands on his pants as if he was dusting off fertilizer, proud to bury another black man. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You see, it's open season, and the reason is that he carries a license to capture or kill those who fit the description. Citizens shout out to the police that he is human. They reply, this is why we don't do drugs, kids. Reminiscent of the 90s anti-drug ad featuring Pee Wee Herman, I am a witness to the synonymy of blackness and criminality reflected in society. 
Here is the evidence. They just planted another lie on a black man. Now it's our choice to believe the stereotype, the autopsy, or what we see. I am an eyewitness to a modern day lynching, tormented by constant images that go viral on screens globally, gripped in a chokehold on our big screens to smartphones. Yet, yesterday we were trending in our business, fashion, music, and challenges. But when it comes to our lives, TikTok don't rush. I am a witness to another assassination throughout cyberspace, the reoccurring onslaught of black men and women desensitized. My eyes blinks at microaggressions and systemic racism killed in broad daylight so we can only see ourselves in darkness, normalizing these images of dead black bodies so no one will care, including ourselves. Yet deep down, there is a sickening response to the tears and blood pooling beyond chalk lines. My eyes follow the crimson footprints now washed away by their lies and paid leaves. I no longer want to be a witness to what comes next. Hashtags like no justice, no peace. Say their names, the, the likes, likes, the shares, the silence, the rage, the, the, the march, the protest, the looting, the soldiers, the soldiers dying, dying in the front lines, alongside, our, alongside our allies. We are shell-shocked, numb, sick and tired. These are the symptoms of PTSD. Whether we march, kneel, or speak, our voices are unheard in the streets. Every living thing on this earth retreats or reacts or stands still until the threat passes. So please stop asking our people who are paralyzed to walk with you. Stop judging others for not speaking up when their vocal cords are shot from screaming, crying for babies they never birthed and yet feel the contractions of these now household names that they can't even remember, but their face are etched in my mind with their mother's cry looped over and over this never ending soundtrack. We are forever in labor with pain that our children will never belong or feel accepted that they are guilty and being groomed from preschool to prison. Before they leave their house, they are reminded by their mamas. Child, stand tall, smile, look straight so you won't come off too hostile. Keep your hands where it can be seen. Move slowly, never run. Don't hang out on the streets. Keep your hoodie off, comply. Answer their questions cordially and politely. And whatever you do, just stay calm and keep the camera rolling. <sighs> rolling. Higgins. Oh my God. This is what you do. You can't talk to too low. Rolling. <laughs> it was so good. That was beautiful. You are a blessed and talented Man. woman. Thank you so very much for being a part of our show. I, I love Ruin. I love her Absolutely. delivery. I can talk about Ruin all day, but we have to move on. Now, our next performer for today yes. is no stranger to the Acoustic Ooh. Energy family. Yes. My brother, Stephen Manders, who currently serves as the Assistant Minister of Music for Oakwood University Church under the direction of Dr. Carton P. Bird. He and his group... Stephen Manders and Decree have released three singles, Be Still, mm -hmm. featuring Naomi Parchment, Adoration, which everybody loves. That has reached over one million viewers, my brother. One million views on platforms all over the world. BET, yep. The Shade Room, and his most recent single oh, yeah. is called Heaven. Bro, this song is absolutely gorgeous. Man, listen, Stephen has songs like Under His Wings, which was published with GIA Publications. Mm -hmm. He's also produced music for artists such as James Fortune and many others. His mission in life is to write music that brings glory to God and touches all lives globally. Without any further ado, yes. help me welcome Stephen Manders. Hey everyone, this is Stephen Manders from Stephen Manders and Decree. I just wanna give a shout out to Dale and Joel the entire Acoustic Energy family. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, and this song, Heaven, really just talks about a place that we're all excited to go. We know this earth isn't our final home. Um, and I'm excited to go to heaven, but really it talks about no more sickness, no more rain, no more dying, no more pain. Um, and you know, the weekend I released this song, it was able to encourage me through my toughest time, losing my grandmother, losing a brother that was very dear to my heart. But it just reminded me that one day we're going to see our loved ones. 
So I don't know where you are in your life right now, but I know that this song can really encourage you and remind you of a place called heaven that we're all excited to go. So hopefully you're blessed by this ministry and this song. God bless you. Heaven. I'm still actually like just listening I to the song you, in my head. I told you, this boy, this guy's no joke. When I first heard that song, Dale Brown, when I say it plays in my car on a regular, and it's basis, not a it's not a busy song. It's it's, good. it's not overly complicated. It's just the content, it's the melody, it's the harmony. Whew. Enough said. I gotta go to heaven, brother. There you go, brother. I have to go I'm to heaven. I'm with you. I'm with you. Now. Coming up next, we're going to hear a word from our dear Pastor Marquis Johns, and he's going to speak directly to our community. Pastor Marquis Johns. Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Keith. Man, I am so excited to be with my boy Dale and Joel. And what they're doing here, uh, it, it is just amazing. And I pray that everybody who logs in receives a blessing now. Dale knew better than to tell me I have five minutes to do whatever I want. Cause now that we've gone live, you know what I'm saying? I can just pretty much say and do anything I want. I can be as radical as I want to be or as conservative as I want to be. But anybody who knows me knows 
conservative ain't in my bag of tricks. And as we are on the last Friday of Black History Month, I feel it imperative and incumbent upon me to deposit this in your spirit, those of you who are of the African descent in the diaspora, I need to deposit something in your spirit. And, and it's in the form of a question, a question posed in the book of Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter three and verse 11. And you don't got to turn there. I just want to just, I just want to lift this for to convey a thought to us or to pose a relevant question to us. And that is in Genesis chapter three, verse 11. So let me set the background because you all know the story so that I can lead us to this point. The point is God has created. He has created on day one. He has created on day two. He has created on day three day four, day five, day six. And on day six, he creates the crowning act of his creation. And that is man. And then we all know because we're all of the same denominational persuasion for the most part that he rested on the seventh day. And so here we see that God creates on the sixth day man. Now, depending on which chapter you're reading, chapter one or chapter two, he created male and female at the same time. So whether he created male, then pulled from her, uh, pulled from him, Eve, or whether he created Adam, which is Hebrew for humankind, all at the same time they were there and they were present. God performs the first wedding ceremony in Genesis chapter two, but we know what happens by the time we get to Genesis chapter three, Eve has, as we have been taught, wandered from her husband's side. She finds herself at the base of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and she decides to do that which God told her she shouldn't do at the behest of a serpent with feet who could talk. Y'all not talking back to me tonight. She decided to go with what the serpent with feet who could talk said over over what her creator had said, and he enticed her to eat from the fruit. Upon eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, tradition tells us she took that fruit to her husband. He saw his woman as fine as she could have been. Now, can I just stop parenthetically and let you know that Adam is also Hebrew for red or for brown earth. And so we know that Eve was a brown, beautiful, woman come on up in here somebody and so he took one look he took one look at his wife now in this fallen state and I could imagine he said with every other man married to a black woman there is no way I want to exist without her come on up in here and talk to me on black history month and so upon seeing her fallen state he took and he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And wouldn't you know it, at that very moment, here comes, here comes, because we don't know the space in between when they ate and when God appeared. All we know is that God appeared. The Bible tells me he came walking in the cool of the day. And he called out the first question, Adam, where are you? Now, I need you to receive this in your spirit. This wasn't a question about where Adam was uh, spatially. This was a question about where Adam was relationally because God finally made it into the presence of Adam and Eve, and he could sense that while he was present, they were distant. You didn't catch it. Let me say it again. He sensed that while he was present, they were distant. And God was not asking them this question because of where they were spatially, spatially, but he realized something had changed relationally. That's the first question. The second question is where I want to draw my question for us today and then lead us to a potential conclusion. The second question he asked upon hearing Adam's response that he hid, for, oh God, he hid from God because he was naked. Now let's just take, for instance, the Bible tells us that he had sewn aprons on himself and was now hiding in the trees. Can I just tell somebody that when you attempt to cover yourself up and that's not enough, how often we go to the thing that we use to cover ourselves up, to hide ourselves, I don't hear nobody. But here it is. God says, God says, God says, God asked him, who told you that you were naked? God says, who told you that you were naked? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Who told you that you were naked? Now, I need you to understand that this is a question more about, ah, come on, watch this. This is a question less, excuse me, about their nudity and more about their identity. The first question was not about where they were spatially, but where they were relationally. This question is not where they are or what they're covered with or not covered with in terms of their nudity, but how they are identified 
identifying themselves. They identify themselves with a condition that they always had, but something has brought their attention to this condition and has made them ashamed. Did you see where the preacher just drove you and parked and now I can get out and talk to you here? The Bible says they answer where God, the question God asked them by identifying themselves in a way that they had always been. And so the relevant question I wanna ask our audience on tonight is not who told you you were naked, but who told you you were black? Who, 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 who told you that you were black? And not only who told you that you were black, but who told you that you were black and then made you ashamed of your blackness? Come on up in here, somebody. Not only were they identified as naked, but because they were now naked, they were ashamed of their nakedness. And something, somebody identified us as black. And now we have, over the course of history, become ashamed of that. Let me tell you why this is important because it has only has been in the last 150 years that the concept of whiteness has been concretized. And the reason it has been so is because it is what United States government and legislation uses to tell you who can and cannot live in the United States. Up until then, whiteness did not exist. One Dr. Ibram Kendi in his book, Stamp from the Beginning, lets us know that in the ancient world, there were some biases, but things like white Europe and black Africa did not exist. Therefore, racist ideas did not exist. It wasn't until Europeans decided that what they needed to do, because in some regards, they were the minority when you put in uh, when you think take into consideration how black people have color, brown people have color, red people have color, yellow people have color, they found that they were the minority because they were the only people without color. I don't hear nobody. I ain't trying to make nobody mad. Just state a couple of facts. Here is what happened to Adam and to Eve. They began to identify themselves by that thing that they were ashamed of. And over the course of history of black people in the diaspora, we have allowed somebody to designate us or to call us something that we have adopted, one, and then two, we feel ashamed of to the extent that we always are uh, apologizing for it. What do you mean by apologizing for it? Why is it that black excellence has to be a thing? Why must black girls be magic? Why must black boys telegraph their joy as though we are ashamed for not having had those things historically? And so all I wanna do is lift for your attention this idea that what you two choose to identify yourself as, if it's something different than what God created you to be, renounce that thing. Now I am proud to be black, but I don't let my blackness mm, take precedence over my being a child of God, nor do I apologize for being something I have always been, nor am I ashamed for the fact that I was born this way. And even though whiteness and Eurocentricity has highlighted it and brought it further and closer to my attention, I don't let myself be burdened by it. I don't let myself be demeaned about it. I don't make myself ashamed of it. I am black in all of its glory. And I am black while I am simultaneously, but most importantly, a child of God. So come on up in here, young black boy and young black girl. And let me tell you that the iconography that depicts Christianity was concentrated and born on the continent of your conception. What do you mean, preacher? Everything that we know about religion came from Africa and not just religion, but language started with you. Uh, mathematics started with you. Come on up in here, little black boy and little black girl with the sun, with the skin kissed by the sun. Language started with you. Mathematics started with you. Science started with you. L listen, Anything that you can think of that is relevant to the world today started on the continent of Africa and therefore you can lay claim to it and never be ashamed of it because God first and foremost created you and he created you the way you are so you need not be ashamed. And so what I just wanted to tell somebody on Black History Month is who told you you were black, but more importantly, you are a child of God. So anything he created you to be, don't be ashamed of it, wear it in all of its glory. God bless you and God keep you. And I pray that you were blessed tonight. Wow. That word. Hey, hey, hey. That's the only word you can use. Like, no, I, oh, it's hey. a long time, I, I wasn't ready for that. I, in my <laughs> mind, I thought I was ready, 
what I was. Doc, and, I, and let me tell you, and let me tell you to keep it a stack with you. I kept it tame. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like there's so much more I could have poured into that. Oh, um, but I, I just kept it tame because you said I had five minutes. So I just wanted to spit out something real quick. But yeah, man, we kept it tame. Uh, we it kept was, it tame. It was but definitely well received. That we can say it was definitely well bless received. You. Bless you. Yeah. Bless you. Are, bless you. Bless you. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's my question, brother. Okay. So you're, you are you are currently in the U.S. Yeah. Um, we're in Canada, and um, we are not necessarily oblivious to what's going on in the community, right. but I'm sure it's a little different in in the U.S. than it is here. So my question is, what what is the temperature like now for you know being in the U.S. for the Black community as it relates to the church? So. You know, he, and, and I'm going to be honest, and my perspective may be different from other people's perspective, but I got to keep it a stack with you. You know, it's become, can't come very fatty and very clean, um, um, chic to be social justice oriented, right? Mm. And I see that in the church that all of a sudden now everybody want to preach social justice messages. Everybody wants to show up in a Pan-African flag. You know what I mean? So it, it, it has influenced the church in a way. And this is the negative. You always start with the bad news. The negative is, you know, it's very chic. It's very vogue. It's very, you know, in right now to be quote unquote social justice. Whereas we aren't giving ourselves the, the, the space, if you will, to, to, to thoroughly educate ourselves on some of the things that we're wearing and some of the things that we're doing and some of the things that we're saying. Social justice is an umbrella that under it has many different there are many different aspects of social justice. There's environmental justice, there's LGBTQIA justice, there is uh, uh, um, immigrant rights. There, there are a, a number of things, but we are all just, you know, social justice out. Um, and I think that that is one of the bad things to this end is that it's just what is for the moment. You know, some people are getting ready to start up their their March planning for what they're going to preach after Black History Month without taking into consideration that in March, the trial of George Floyd's killers will begin. Wow. Um, we need to be prepared to hit the streets the way we did when George Floyd was killed. If his, if we, if, if we know anything about America in this regard, and that typically the officers get acquitted, it took a lot to get Ahmaud Arbery's killers acquitted. I mean, get them convicted, but they weren't police officers. And so what we should be thinking right now, we should be educating ourselves on our radical history and on the history of social justice movements or black power movement or black liberation theology and womanist theology we should be doing we should be taking more time to educate ourselves and be prepared to have an intelligent answer or to know what's next should this trial go the way of most trials that that's the bad the good is we are more conscious of mm. who we are and what we're about and there are some individuals doing some digging and doing some studying and talking um, in our churches about the importance of who we are as a people, who what our history in this country has been. Um, one such voice who I just, I mean, she, she's, I mean, I, you, if you haven't heard her, you better go and hear something she's preached, Claudia Marion Allen, um, who is uh, an Amer African American literature major and has studied that at the doctoral level, but she has been really bringing Bringing our attention to the plight of Black people in America and the plight of marginalized people in America. So I think that's also the good, which most times the gift can also be the curse. So the gift is we are more aware, we're more heightened, we're more sensitive to the plight of Black people in America. And many young preachers are now trying to say, hey, look, we need to be intentional about how we minister in the communities that our churches exist in. But that also brings some bad to where now, you're just trying to pull some social justice concept out of a text and preach it so that you can get some likes, some follows, and some friends on social media. So that that's that's the good and the bad of what's going on in the black church, particularly the Seventh Day Adventist black church in a, in a, in America. Wow. Wow. wow! So wow! So I'm going to ask you this this simple question. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, your humble opinion, do you feel like the church is doing enough to support? The black community. No, um, and here's why. Uh, first and foremost, let's understand that the Seventh Day Adventist Church was founded in America. In America, more than half of the revenues that are generated every year are generated in North American Division. So notice, I said 
the church was started in America, but the finances that are generated are generated in the North American division, which uh, Canada is a part of. So over $740 million are being sent to the General Conference every year that comprise its $2 billion. Another $500 million is being sent by the Inter-American Division, right? So when you look at the bulk of the monies that carry our denomination, they're coming from America and in the Inter-America Division where there's a lot of Black folk, although they speak Spanish, right? You, you with me, you with me? There's a lot of Brown and Black yeah. people. However, when Ted Wilson when George Floyd is killed, he's not coming out and saying anything about that. When uh, Amal Arbery is killed, he's not coming out and saying he's not he's not honoring the fact that that this denomination has its headquarters, has its finance, ha has its financial base here in the states. And the things that bother the states should be front page news to him, but they are not. And so in our communities, because we live in a different time, you know, it's not like when they tried to tell people in Martin Luther King, like literally conferences tried to tell black people when Martin Luther King was marching not to go to DC and not to march with him. Nobody's telling us we can't do that. But at the same time, our communities or the communities where people of African descent live are disproportionately affected by some of the things that crescendo in police brutality. And are we now funneling resources to those churches to ensure that the education necessary, the stewardship, like, because our, I believe the Seventh-day Adventist message is perfect for people of African descent. When you think about our health message, when you think about our emphasis on stewardship, when you think about our emphasis on education, listen, I became a Seventh-day Adventist in 27 and immediately went from poor to upper middle class. Mm. Right. So let me say that again. I became a Seventh day Adventist at the age of 27 and immediately went from poor to upper middle class. Why? Because of the emphasis on education, because the importance of stewardship, because of some of the things that are germane to our denomination and to our theology. Right. And so I believe that it is perfectly poised to help people of color, particularly those who are in disenfranchised and marginalized communities. But are we funneling that $740 million back into those communities? I think not. And so it's one thing that he's not speaking. It's another thing that he's not diverting the necessary resources to the those communities to see something changed. Wow. 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 So, I mean, you got my brain spinning right now. What can Sorry. we do as a people? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a Black Lives Matter movement and then there, right. there's such a sensitivity towards even mentioning that in our churches. But what can we do as a people to create change in our community, whether some people say we need to start in the church. Some people say start in the community. Like, what do, what can we do? Like, what can we do as a people? Well, first, let's address something you just said because, and I'm gonna talk about this at another time. But there are pastors, um, like the pastor of the College Dell Community Church, who sent out a cyclical, who sent out a letter that condemned the Black Lives Matter organization without affirming the merit of the Black Lives Matter slogan, as though the two are somehow inseparable. And what we got to do is we got to stop acting like that because. There are many things that religious uh, leaders of other denominations and other faith traditions say that we agree with while not subscribing to their the entirety of their belief system. For instance, I love some of what the Dalai Lama stands for, but I'm not a Buddhist. And so don't try to make the Black Lives Matter movement and slogan inseparable. If you're going to condemn what you may see as the the socialist leanings of the Black Lives Matter organization, be sure to affirm the slogan the idea that black lives matter, right? So that's one thing that we could be doing while, while you know, religious conservatives and also, you know, let's be honest, in the Seventh-day Adventist church in North America, particularly in America, there are some Seventh-day Adventists who subscribe to Trumpism, right? And so what we could be doing is while we may not agree with the organization Black Lives Matter, let's seek to affirm the slogan that Black Lives Matter. So that's where we can start with some of our more right leaning, conservative, white, Republican, Seventh-day Adventists. That, that's that's low hanging fruit. While you may want to condemn that organization make sure you're affirming the slogan. Another thing that we can do again is we need resources. We need to do what like, you know, the Black Panther Party was doing in Oakland and in Chicago, we were feeding children. We need the resources to where we could be feeding hundreds or even thousands of people who don't have food. Because when you look at, I used to pastor in Philadelphia, Dale, you came to um, lead worship for us out there. 
Philadelphia, my church, um, was in the fifth largest city in the nation with the fourth largest concentration of African Americans. And the church was in a community that had the seventh largest recidivism rate in a state where per 100,000, the people are more incarcerated than 12 founding NATO countries. I don't think you caught what I just said. Pennsylvania has an incarceration rate that per 100,000 rivals 12 founding NATO countries. The community I pastored in had the seventh largest recidivism rate. What is recidivism? That means that people who go to jail eventually end up back in jail within a year of being released from jail. But what resources were being diverted to that community so that we could foster home ownership? You got to understand that because of slaveocracy, blockbusting, redlining, black codes, we have not been able to amass generational wealth. We have been at the bottom end of the economic spectrum to where the wealth divide between us and our white counterparts, we think that the white church is just doing some. The, the white people ain't baptizing nobody. They got generational wealth. And it has been for years that the black church and its evangelistic thrust has been keeping with members this church this organization afloat so now for our brothers across the aisle who have that generational wealth because they owned a home that had equity in it but they were able to borrow against to send their kids to school so they didn't end up with debt dale joe y'all went to college both of us all three of us got student loan debt to this day that's not the testimony of our white counterparts so let's start diverting some of the resources that they've been able to benefit up from because of their privilege i don't need you to just say oh yeah there is a such thing as white privilege I need you to start utilizing that privilege to help those of us in these impoverished communities make those communities better with education and resources, financial specifically, so that we can build um, um, so that we can build uh, programs and systems to not just educate, but to get them ready for the job market and to keep them out of jail so that they're not always coming to the church for food, but we put them in a position where they learn how to dress for a job interview, where we get the check mark re removed from the, you know, you got, there's a box that you got to check if you've ever been to jail. That's a violation. Look, that the old saying was, if I go to jail, I've paid my debt to society. Stop asking me about a debt that I've already paid, right? And so those are some of the things. Those are two, two things. One is low-hanging fruit. Stop trying to dismiss or demonize the organization without affirming the slogan Black Lives matter and then second because our denomination or the denomination that we're a part of the majority of the funds that keep this thing running are generated right here in america where we are seeing some of what we see a wealth gap we see uh drug infested communities we see you know those things so give us the financial resources restructure the tithe so that we're able to keep more money in our communities to do more for the people we're trying to baptize Wow. wow, we should have you come and do like a <laughs> workshop for everybody because it, it's so deep. It's so interesting how you break down even the whole concern that we have. Because I did hear a lot of us heard about the 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 origin or more so the root of the whole the the whole Black Lives Matter movement and mm -hmm. you know where it came from. And they, you're right. I remember that whole thing where people are condemning its origin, but like you said. There's so many things that we have jumped on, taken the baton and ran with without even understanding where it came from. And we found pretty much, you said, find the, 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 the sense out of the nonsense, even if, whether, don't argue about whether it's sense or nonsense afterwards. But in reality, right now, whether you want to believe it or not, black lives do matter. Right. And, and, and it's low hanging fruit. And, and, and I want to be honest with you, what I'm referring to. Um, about Pastor Jerry Arnold at College Dell Community Church in College Dell, Tennessee. That didn't happen five years ago. That happened in 2020, mm -hmm. right? Where he was up preaching a, a sermon um, about black and, and sent around a letter. I have a copy of the letter where he condemned the Black Lives Matter organization without affirming Black Lives Matter as a slogan. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, it, it, it's, it's not that deep because I bet you that same preacher got some John Piper on his shelf. <laughs> he got some Joyce Myers on his shelf. Mm -hmm. He got some Billy Graham on his shelf, but I'm not accusing him of being Southern Baptist, charismatic, uh, reform, Calvinist, or any of those things. There is merit in some of the things we, the, 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 the civil rights movement in America was founded by, you know, well, let me not say he was the founder of, but Martin Luther King, one of the more notable faces and voices of the civil rights movement, we tried to malign him too because he went and studied with Gandhi, but he didn't go out and study with Gandhi and become a Hindu. 
<laughs> right? He went out, understood Gandhi's approach to social activism and civil change, incorporated that, but he preached Jesus, you know what I mean? Right. And so we gotta stop trying to, you know, uh, you know, we try to demonize the entire movement and then rob the slogan of its merit. And that's, 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 that's foolishness. That's the, that's the nonsense and nonsense. Wow, wow. Pastor Johns, we, we, we definitely, we're definitely gonna have you back on the show again if you're we willing to. to be a part. Of course. We have to. Yeah, on the real, thank you so very much for being a no part. Problem. Truly appreciate everything that you are doing uh, for the church and the black community. Yes, uh, so thank you for being a part. And we'll Bless be touch, my brother. GIA Productions is a performing arts group whose main objective is to engage, entertain, and educate audiences through dramatic presentations and other artistic expressions. Yeah. Now listen, to date, the group's greatest accomplishments include participation in the 2012 Toronto Fringe Festival, where they staged an original play entitled, Do You Remember Me? The writer of GIA's material, Greg Burkett, is a published author, poet, and educator. GIA believes that its mandate of spreading awareness concerning faith and black history and culture is always relevant and important. Ladies and gentlemen, Greg. And his lovely daughter, Nalia Burkett. What's up, Acoustic Energy family? My name is Greg Burkett, and this is my daughter. Nalia. And I got to say what's up to Joel and Dale. Hi, Mr. Brown. This piece that you're about to see is called Here's Why. And Here's Why was basically inspired by Marcus Garvey uh, when he said, a people without knowledge of their past history, culture, and origins is like a tree without roots. Every year I get asked by uh, people of all persuasions, why Black History Month? And uh, this piece really just addresses that and sort of deals with the fact that we think that Black history is something that needs to be celebrated year round and that it is important to understand exactly where you've come from in order to know uh, why things are the way they are presently and where you're going in the future. So I hope you all like it. I wanna send a big shout out to uh, Jamie Jarvis who did the graphics for the video. And again, the name of the piece is Here's Why. God bless. In the second month of every passing year, for four weeks, we speak about it. Read about it. Learn some new and unique things about it. No doubt about it. We appear fairly proud of it. We read, teach, preach. Wear African clothes. Listen to the I have a dream speech. And then suppose that we know everything, everything there, there is, is to know about, about it. it. We proudly stand on command. Open our mouths wide and bellow. Lift every voice and sing. And then with the first signs of spring, we, we forget, forget all, all about, about it. it. Many even question its merit. Is it even worth it? To have a month packed with events and services? It makes some feel anxious and nervous. While others just don't see the purpose. Black, Black history. history. I'm just a kid. Do I really need to know all of this? Black, Black history. history. I'm old and set in my ways. Why should I care what happened back in those days? Black, Black history. history. The past is the past and it isn't coming back. Black, Black history. history. Why should I be bothered learning dates, names, and trivial facts? Black, Black history. history has been ignored. Pushed to the periphery for many reasons. But let us tell you why we need to celebrate it every day and in every season. Marcus Garvey said, a people without knowledge of their past history origin and culture is like a tree without roots. And I don't know about you, but I believe this brother was speaking the truth. The good and the bad need to be explored in order for us to move forward. We need to know that we were a strong civilized people before we were stolen and tortured. In Second Chronicles, the Bible says that the armies of Libya and Ethiopia numbered in the millions. And Moses, Israel's great emancipator, was a caring father to his half-Nubian children. Hmm, that's right. Moses' wife was from the land of our forefathers, with dark skin and thick hair, just like yours, my beautiful daughter. Ancient African women were large and in charge, ruling enormous kingdoms with strength, poise, and wisdom. Queen Candace, the Empress of Ethiopia, ensured her people's survival commanding huge armies that struck fear in all of her rivals. Let's not forget the Queen of Sheba, whose real name was Makita. She possessed beauty and treasure. Her worth was beyond measure. Queen Amina of Nigeria, Nefertiti, Ya Asentiwa of the Ashanti, led their kingdoms with passion and heart. But before the men get jealous, 
Ahem. We should mention some of their male counterparts. Mansa Musa of Mali accumulated so much wealth that we're told his kingdom led the world in possession of gold. The life of his grandson, brave Emperor Sundiata, was the inspiration for Disney Simba and Mufasa. And in Second Kings, Hezekiah and Israel were saved from Assyria by a Nubian king named Taharka. After we ruled the world, the toughest part of our history came along. The enslavement of our people lasted 400 years long. African chiefs and Europeans treated humans, which was wrong. Over 11 million stolen from the land where they belong. But don't you hold your heads down. We are the sons and daughters of the survivors. Our people are strong. And we should celebrate this legacy from now till kingdom come. Enslaved blacks built the White House and Wall Street. We created spirituals like Wade in the Water, sung with voices sweet. We could have accepted defeat, but we refused. And the most important tool we used was an unshakable faith in God to overcome the abuse. We made it through colonialism and the civil rights movement, black pride and black power. However, in this very hour, some would say we've taken a turn for the worse. Apathy, self-hate, and black-on-black -black crime at an all-time high leaves too many of our young champions lying in a hearse. So how do we return to glory? That's the million dollar question. Listen with both ears because we have some suggestions. First, knowledge of our past is essential. Without it, our youth will never truly understand their potential. Our lineage is lined with common people and influential leaders with great credentials. If my ancestors could create great structures that would last, then why can't I work hard and get an A plus in math? Countless historians say that North, South, East, and West Africans were highly respected. We need to know that our African heritage should be embraced and not rejected. Next, the enslavement of our people should not be ignored or selectively neglected. We do need to work to destroy its lasting effect, but there are more lessons to be learned than most suspect. If I know that my ancestors were not allowed to read, then I should make sure to use my education to succeed. If I know that my people were denied the right to own land because power and worth were connected to property, then I should be motivated to own something to leave behind for my own progeny. And finally, though our names, our culture, our self-worth was taken away in an attempt to leave us broken and flawed, what kept us then and what will keep us now is a close connection to the Almighty God. If I know that my ancestors called on our Heavenly Father during whippings, brandings, hangings, rapes, and other forms of terrorism for survival, then when I need answers to financial woes, unemployment, racism, and other socioeconomic foes, I'll cling to the promises in the Bible. So let's celebrate our worth and put God first. And instill this mentality in our kids from birth so that stereotypes and words won't be able to tear them down. Young man, pull up your pants and stop hanging around. Young lady, if you don't believe that you're precious, then neither will others. We need to hear this daily from our fathers and mothers. Love yourselves, black people. We are a royal priesthood, children of the king. Sons and daughters of kings, queens, slaves, stand brave and bold. From generation to generation. Black history is our testimony. And, and testimonies, testimonies need to, to be told. told. Greg and Nalia, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amazing job. Love it. We know that wow. GIA is in good hands in good when hands. Greg steps down because Nalia should be able to good take hands, over. Good hands, good hands. So no. while we were on our little Hiatus. quarantine, yes, for a little bit. I noticed that you've been posting oh, yes. um, about something that you're actually doing. Yes, we have a workshop. It's a master it's amazing, class. Man. I coming up that, I that. Um, for musicians, choir members, choir directors, praise and worship leaders, anybody that's in music in and outside of the church, we're inviting everyone to be a part to participate in this workshop. I'm guessing this is an online workshop. It is an online workshop, so you can participate from anywhere in the world. You can register uh, musicislife.simpletix.ca. Okay. You know, so if I was to register, what exactly are people getting out of this? Like, why should someone register for this workshop? Well, a lot of the presenters are world-renowned musicians. Yes, we absolutely. have a James Hall. Yeah. Some of you should know James Hall. Mm -hmm. We have Trey McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. We also have Mr. Minister Patrick Riddick. Yes. And in addition to just getting a good word from these guys, getting knowledge, gaining understanding, we will be doing different tutorials on the voice, tutorials on how to set up your praise team, how to uh, do better as a team, 
and just being a better musician, being a better minister of music, everything having to do with the ministry of music we're going to try to cover. So basically this workshop is for all musicians and just to help you become a better well-rounded oh, most definitely. musician. Yes, yes. So yes, while yes. we were just talking about um, your workshop, I had an idea. Let me hear the idea. Don't get mad at me. What's and, well, So don't get mad at me for two things. Um, I said I wasn't going to do this because we oh, are no, in no. 2021. Don't do it, don't do it. But he's going to do it. I'm thinking it might be time for the giveaway. Oh my gosh. He's doing it. Whoa. He's the Whoa. Whoa. He's doing it. His shoulder is moving. People, we need some help. We can't have Joel doing this again. We need some suggestions for a new move. At this point, any move will work. Let me just explain something. I definitely got calls. Text messages, people went my DMs talking about my movie. No, so they I just don't know how to tell you that they don't like it. They're Canadian. They try to be nice. That's, that's Not everyone's what... Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. So, today, Dale doesn't know about this, but I think we are going to give away a free oh. admission to your workshop. Hmm. That is nice. <laughs> that is nice. That's a, that's, a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Somebody's going to be really lucky. Are we, are we okay with... Are you going to... Are we going to talk about this off screen or are we no, good? No, we're good. We're good. We're fine. So we are giving away a free workshop to Dale's Music is Life workshop um, sponsored by, by the Acoustic Energy Team. Yes. And I love that. That a little better? That works. That okay. works for me. So this goes out to anyone. You can all answer. And here is the question. Drum roll, please. <laughs> This what? What? You don't like my symbols? It was your splash. It <laughs> caught me off guard. It caught me off guard. It caught me off guard. So can I get a drum roll again? But this time I don't need the splash. <laughs> this black inventor has basically invented over three hundred pro products um, with the peanut. What is the name of that black inventor? And and where do you put your answers again? You put your answers in the chat. In the chat. Make sure you put your answers in the chat there right you now. Go. Right now. Don't forget, answers in the chat. Go down. God has truly blessed our community with outstanding gifts. Acoustic Energy is an online platform that aims to create a safe space for artists to share their stories, showcase their gifts, and express love to our creator in a global space. We are dedicated to helping improve our community through the arts. And this is why we rely on donations from viewers just like you. Your donations go towards helping us purchase equipment and fund the operation of this growing organization. So how exactly do you give, you may ask? It's simple. We invite you to send a donation using e-transfer or cash app to give at acousticenergy.tv or visit us on our website acousticenergy.tv under the button give and while you're there it'd be great if you could subscribe to our youtube channel together we can continue to make ae an amazing reality enjoy the show good hands no I want to get. I want to hear some more singing. Can we get some I'm, more singing? I'm here for that. Now this next group is amazing. We've heard them all over the world. The Aeolians of Oakwood University. The group originally started uh, by Dr. Eva Dykes in 1946. Uh, Since its inception, the choir has traveled widely, touching the hearts of both young and old with their inspirational singing and their beautiful song. They have won a host of awards, including. World Choir Game Spiritual Champions, 4P at HBCU Choir of the Year and Choir of the World Champions. Listen, these guys are amazing. Like, I've heard them before and I literally said, that's not them singing, it's a record. But we can easily say right now that this is one of the best choirs. Definitely. In the world. In the world, in the world. Without Simple. any further ado, help us welcome the Aeolians of Oakwood University. What's up, everyone? I want to say hello to Dale and to Joel from the Acoustic Energy TV family. Um, we shall overcome a summer through the civil rights movements of the 60s, and it became their road march. And uh, all of us are familiar with the congressman that we lost a few months ago, John Lewis. 
he would always say that it was this song that uh, gave them the energy to march and to riot and to get through those merciless beatings and, mm. and all the jailings that they had to kind of go through. So We Shall Overcome was an anthem then. And um, who would think that in 2020, 2021, this song would kind of resurface because of all the social injustice and all the political strife and angst that we see going on in our, in our country, in our world. So We Shall Overcome is, is just that song with a very simple message to keep hope alive and to not be discouraged and we'll get through this someday. We shall, we shall
Come to the end of another show, and we had an amazing time, brother. Um, I had a great time just being here, <laughs> hang out with you it guys. Good. It was good. I'm hang out with the guys behind the camera. Yeah. I wish people could just see. No, I wish people could give us a new <laughs> dance for your giveaway move. That's what we need people to do. I'm just saying, you know, send a message or something. No, don't ever do that again. Listen, everybody, we've come to the end of another show. Follow us on Instagram at Acoustic Energy TV, Facebook. Acoustic Energy TV, and also don't forget to donate at acoustic. Sorry, give at acousticenergy.tv. There's something that I definitely have to do, and if you'd like this done, definitely send us an email to acousticenergytv at gmail.com. We have two special birthdays that mm. we need to shout out. First one is Josiah. Mm. That kid, man, like he's a hardcore D. A hardcore acoustic energy supporter for supporter. sure. So Josiah. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Joe. And then my little niece, Scarlett Rain, mm. turn three. Uh, Scarlett, we love you, love you, love you. Yes. Um, and happy birthday, my love. I hope that you're enjoying your third birthday. Yes. Now we have officially come. To an end. To an end. We just need some new dance move suggestions for Joel. Because he shouldn't do that dance ever again. In life. Like, not even for something else. Are even we, if they were paying him. I think we can cut now. No, I, don't cut, because the I people need to know that your dance... Sean, Sean. No, the people need to know that your dance is bad. It's really bad. Sean? It was almost as bad as... Rhythm! <laughs> <laughs>